want to say thank you for both of you to come and uh, begin to answer the public's questions on this. Uh, as a council member for what I believe to be the most ethnically and economically diverse portions of this city with 65 different language groups, this discussion is very personal. Uh, it's very relevant. I'm very glad to know that we've begun the process of reaching out to all of the uh, African social uh, communities, uh, whether they be churches and organizations, and I, my office would be glad to work with you and communicate with those communities we've already been asked to attend some communication against. That person seems to me that part of the challenge, and, and clearly we're an international city and, and the airport is the front line, as well as we see this morning in the uh, chronicles and discussions about the port of Houston as well. Uh, so it's good, good to know that we've got some sort of protocols working there. Um, I think that the, the public has some sort of concern in relationship to the incubation period. It seems to be a five to ten day uh, incubation period before it becomes uh, prevalent. Can you speak to that issue of the incubation period? And can you also speak to us about assuming, we just have to assume that we will have a case, and I think is the most conservative approach. Uh, how are we preparing our first responders across the board, whether they be ambulance, fire, and police, to assume that they're walking into that kind of a scenario uh, at any given time? Would you ask to address those two questions? Sure. So the incubation uh, situation, uh, for, so the, the incubation is between two and 21 days. And most patients become symptomatic at the eight to 10 day mark. That's what seems to be the, the, the peak uh, incidence. And so we talk about the airport, there's a lot of attention to the airport. I actually think that the airport is one of our safer locations because as patients are on the flight, which is a many hour flight generally, the flight crew becomes aware and then they notify and we've got systems in place. Um, I'm more concerned about the situations we had in Dallas, where a gentleman came, was in the community for a couple days, developed symptoms, and went to, and went to the hospital, and potentially exposing folks uh, between the time when he or she or have near developed symptoms and when they go to the hospital. But one of my biggest concerns, and, and I can't stress this enough, we have to make certain as we move forward, in my opinion, that we make sure that if anybody develops symptoms, they cannot be afraid to step forward. We cannot create an environment where people think that if they step forward, they're going to somehow be ostracized or there's going to be... So there are no there. false calls to the medical facility. That's exactly right. At this point, we want, you know, if you think that you meet the case definition, you, we need to make it so it's a very welcome environment for you to raise your hand. We do not want people to be afraid of what they're for. Uh, that was, those are my comment earlier about the family members who are going to quarantine and we need to make that not a negative experience for them. Uh, your second question went to the, uh, the first responders, and that's a dynamic process right now. So we've had PPE, personal protective equipment, in place basically going back to when our weapons of mass destruction preparedness uh, started to spool up. Uh, much of that is worn out. It's over 10 years old. There's some issues with the replacing of the fire department, just took delivery of some. We've been talking with the police department. They're sort of the same situation in that they have some, they do like, you know, the, maybe these uh, so it's dynamic. And as I said earlier, I'm hoping that today the fire department will be able to get us some new guidance along with the new PPE to the fire stations. But uh, even once that's out, once that is out, as we continue to watch things progress in Dallas and, and elsewhere, we need to recognize there's not going to be an answer. There will be answers as we go down the road with this. Uh, so we, it's dynamic. We're moving forward today. I'm hopefully it will be a big day for uh, addressing that. Uh, but it won't be the end of the story. And I think it's important to repeat. I think I heard you say that. Houston has only one direct flight from continental Africa, and that is from Lagos, is that correct? Sure. That's my understanding. Comes in at 4 a.m. every day. So uh, uh, we have some limitations in that regard. It would, that we only have the one, the one flight from continental Africa, if not more. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Yeah. Dr. Burris, perhaps you could speak just a little bit about the precautions that are, that are EMTs on the ambulances go through, our firefighters go through already uh, on a routine basis to prevent infection. Because the Ebola is not the only thing that, that our first responders would worry about. That's right. So we've been, so remember, Ebola is not airborne, it's still <coughs> droplet protection. And uh, that's the same as the flu, quite honestly. Um, so they have been, they've been trained over the years and, and being very transparent and, and honest, they, they were good about wearing their gloves. They've not been so good over the years about wearing masks. 
right? But they're quickly getting better at that. Uh, there are also uh, gowns that have been avail made available to them, uh, which I anticipate we're going to start using a little more of, but this is all for the, the uh, body substance isolation. Uh, the new PPE that we're, we just took delivery of is a step above that. It's actually a full body suit, and um, so they, they have had training in that, but it's the sort of thing which they don't routinely use. They're more routinely using the masks, the gloves, and uh, sometimes the, the gowns. And so this will be a, a change for them. That's why we have to get the training out. They uh, also, you know, annually get reinforced the message about, about cases. Because we also worry about meningitis. It seems like almost every year there's a meningitis case. And, and, uh, and TB is a constant threat. And TB is airborne. And so, you know, there are, uh, there are constant threats. They are constantly being uh, brought up to you. But, you know, the spotlight is really drawing their attention back to that training uh, once again. Councilmember I really appreciate your presentation because it was calming, it was uh, educational, and I think with, with all these diseases, we have to educate. And the mayor's words were, uh, let's not overreact. Your words, uh, no panic. Uh, talk about risk we do not face. I mean, and, and, and I think the, the media is part of the problem where they take, and it's the disease of the month, chikungunya, you know, enteral virus 68, Ebola, which is on and on. There's a fervor, and I think the medical industrial complex feeds it. So if the media takes it with a grain of salt or vitamin C tablet and, and just divide by two and subtract 10, you got the real story like you've given us today. That they, these fear mongers go out there, uh, they push diseases, they make money off of Tamiflu and whatever they think is the cure. You know, I like the calming effect, the education that you've done. Just a comment on, you mentioned uh, uh, this Ebola was here, no, in Africa 10 years ago. It's more deadly strain. It wasn't? No, it's the same. Uh, so there are basically there are five basic strains. They're all very similar in how they, uh, how lethal they can be. But the first outbreaks occurred in the 1970s. They were generally deep in the jungle, uh, amongst small communities, and they were able to be contained there. So as the mayor pointed out, we've been, you know, there are, there are world experts who have been dealing with Ebola for decades. And what's different here is that they got into a more urban environment where it then spread. Okay, so it had the, the same population. intensity but subsided to some degree? No, it's, remember when this outbreak in, uh, when those three countries first started, it had a 90% death rate. Right. Because we now have got some healthcare and there's some healthcare infrastructure there that wasn't there before, the death rate has come down all the way to 60%. That's right, that's yeah. what I read, that, that the 90% death rate is, is way down to 50%. It, is that the, the benefit of, Mother Nature mutating to the disease, or no? No, that's just the benefit that uh, in the deep jungle, where in, when this first out, right. first outbreak occurred, where the areas basically had no healthcare infrastructure at all, and so people were staying at home, and their families were trying to care for them. People basically become profoundly dehydrated, their blood pressures get low, uh, and they were dying from that. In the hospital, we while there is no cure, we can do things to support the body. Those folks that have a chance that their bodies are strong enough, their immune systems that happen to be strong enough that they could get through it with the right help. We're providing them that right help. And uh, so that's why uh, some people are surviving today that didn't before. Uh, but the, the virus has not gotten any less than that. And that point right there is a good educational point. Those that have a non-compromised system, strength of the system, will fight that disease off more than anything that's out there. No, it's still got a 60% mortality rate. A lot of those folks are young and healthy. Right. So okay. um, but I don't think I would characterize it later. Before I run out of time, you, you mentioned the animals, the, the dogs, the cats, the mice, the horses have. That's the same way with HIV. It, in the animal, it does not kill the host for whatever reason. But I think if you look through science through the years, any time man transspecies the virus, somehow getting from animal to humans, that's where you get in trouble. We have no defense against those. So, 
Well, the, the opposite is true as well. There are viruses in the, in the world that humans get and don't become sick with, but other animals will die from. So it goes both ways. Right. But I'm thinking of the one right here. So, so to, the, to the public, and the mayor's mentioned this and you, that, that let's not overreact. And every African American that rises to our airport, or anyone with a sneeze, or anyone with a fever, let's not overreact. You've got one, one case, and, and uh, uh, I like the calming effect, the educational approach you took to it, uh, Director Williams and Dr. First. It's the right thing. Educate. Tell people to be cautious. I appreciate your report.